So my philosophy with bringing moisture back to the land is to, to try to do it in the places where it already exists to some extent. Um, you know, some of those valley-eating head cuts we talked about might not be the first place to start. And I, I get this point of view because most of the time I'm a one-person show. I do this work myself. Um, so I try to take on things that I know I can accomplish and make a difference. And I, I know as landowners out here, a lot of you are like that. You, you may have the collective resources of just a few people. So how do you look at our vast landscape and figure out what are the places you're going to work on? So through the restoration work I've done, collaborations with um, a lot of people in this room, um, I've developed a set of guiding principles. That, and a lot of you may have seen this for erosion control, for um, water harvesting, but this is basically a way to bring moisture back to the land. And first and foremost, we protect the wet areas that we have because understanding the big picture of what's going on the landscape, I think we can all see how valuable those are. And of course, there's the habitat issues, just water supply issues, all of those things. So first and foremost, it's to protect what's there and manage it appropriately. Um, and then next is to try to expand those areas. So most of the restoration work I actually do is taking a wetland that's got some little remnant intact part of it and trying to expand the actual area that that covers. And so um, we call that the sweet spot. And that just means that is an area of the landscape that has some regenerative process going for it, whether it's a little bit of extra moisture, um, a little bit better vegetation, what's going on there that we can use, that we can actually plug into to drive that regenerative process forward. So the next step would be to stabilize active erosion and prevent further degradation, to prevent further gully cutting, to prevent incision, to prevent rills from working their way up into meadows that would otherwise maintain sheep flow. So, um, you know, the first step is to protect, and then the second step is to stabilize. And I would say it's stabilizing the margins of the most productive areas first and foremost, um, and the ones that we can uh, make a, a positive change on for a relatively low input of energy and time. Next is to restore dispersed flow and increase infiltration at every opportunity. And so, again, if we think about the erosion processes and how water moves across the landscape, managing sheep flow is a heck of a lot easier than managing water once it's in an arroyo or even a river for that matter. And the beauty of managing water when it's still sheep flow and maintaining dispersed flow is that does have a benefit for our river systems. It has a huge benefit downstream of storing water in the soil, um, reducing the amount of erosion, erosion that occurs. So while I do support river restoration, when we put money into a river restoration project, it, it doesn't address everything that's else that's going on upstream in the watershed and in, in the uplands. So that's just something to consider. Um, the next part, and this is where we get really proactive, it's to cultivate restorative plant communities and to cultivate healthy uh, biologically active soils. So Doug's going to get into the cultivation. And by cultivation, of course, I don't mean tillage. I mean this, this is our hands at work, whether it's making compost, brewing compost teas, um, doing erosion control, doing things that allow more moisture to soak into the ground and grow better vegetation and improve that bio biology. And the underlying theme to all of this is that whatever solutions we create have to um, meet the site-specific conditions, and they should mimic natural forms and processes because that's what are going to make our solutions permanent, a permanent part of the ecosystem. Um, so with stream restoration, a lot of you might be familiar with natural channel design. We mimic the act actual processes that happen in nature and just try to speed up the healing that's already there. The same with Doug's, Doug's work. He's utilizing the microbiology and the, the understanding of what that biology does in the, the successional process that he was just talking about. So that's a key underlying basis to all of this is first we have to understand the process, understand what's going on, understand the cause and the nature of the degradation. That's first and foremost. And then 
we can understand what uh, natural healing processes we can plug into to restore parts of the landscape. 